Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to read verse 24 to 27. It says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thoughts, not with uncertainty. Thoughts are fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. If I'm to summarize this passage we just read, verses 24 to 27, I'll do so in four sentences. The Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul is telling us four things. One, that there is a race to run. Two, that there is a prize to win. Three, that there is a way to run. And four, that there is something to fear. Let me go over that again. If you look at this text... You can divide it into four parts under this head. Is one, there is a race to run. What that means is that every Christian is a runner, an athlete, spiritually speaking. There is a race to run. There is a prize to win, number two. And that's what this conference is about, awaiting the crown of glory. And in fact, Paul tells us here, Number three, there is a way to run. You notice it says, run in such a way. Let me just give you the words. It says right there in verse 24, run in such a way that you may obtain it. The New Living Translation says, so run to win. The word so means in this manner. Run in this manner. There's a way to run. That's the way you will run and you will not get the prize. Because it says, if you do not run lawfully, you will not be crowned. Isn't that what the Bible says? So there's a way to run. But then you must remember, you must always keep in mind that there is something to fear. And I'll tell you what that is. But I'm not going to be analyzing all of these headings today. I just have one goal in coming to this verse. Paul is using real athletic competition in real life to point to another reality of a race. And then it says, just like they run to win a prize, we too run to win a prize. Paul says they run to win a perishable prize, a perishable crown. In fact, a wreath, a flower, that after a while withers. He says, but we, we are in this race for an imperishable crown. Now, this is why I'm here in this verse. The question now is, what is this crown? What is this imperishable crown? This crown of glory that we're talking about. Now, I'm going to try to give a definition or a description, if you like, and then we'll go to Philippians. But let me try and give you a definition or a description. So you know exactly what you should have so you can have an idea of what we are talking about. But before I give you that definition, let me make two statements, two points. One has already been made. Let me say this first. That when we talk about the crown, please don't think of a cup. The kind that kings and royalties wear. You know that headgear with diamonds and precious stones? If I'm, cor if I'm wrong, please correct me. I think Queen Elizabeth's crown, the diamond that was used, was gotten, given to her, given to them by the Chinese government. Am I correct? Something? 
not so sure, but beautiful crown if you ever saw it, at least on television. But that's not the kind of thing we're talking about the headgear. Well, maybe we will wear such headgears in heaven. I don't know, but I don't think that's what Paul is talking about here, headgears. Now, the second thing I want to say is that, now, this has already been said, pastor said it the very first night, that the crown is not a gift, it's a reward. Now, whatever this is, whatever the crown is, now, I just told you not to think of a, a headgear. Well, <laughs> we may wear that. I don't know. I've not seen a passage of scripture. But I, I'm saying don't think of a headgear right now. Something you're going to, everybody's going to wear on his head. So whatever that thing is, which I'm going to try to describe or define shortly, whatever it is, we have established in this conference that it is not a gift. It is a reward. Let me repeat. It is not a gift. It's a reward. Salvation is a gift. But this thing we're talking about is not a gift. It is a reward. Now, what's a reward? I took out my dictionary to check the meaning of the word reward just to remind myself. And this is what I found. That it is something given in recognition of service or effort or work. It is something given in return for a good done, a good thing done. It is something given in recognition of service or, or work. That's what a reward is. So, now I said, I thought I should establish those two things. To try to shift your mind from a headgear. And then to remind you that we're not talking about a gift. We're talking about a reward. Something that will be given to you because of something that you have done. So, what is this imperishable crown of glory? Now, I'm going to attempt a description or a definition. First, let me put it simplistically. Let's put it simply. It is ultimate salvation. Of course, you've heard it said again and again in this. If you have been in heritage for a long time, you would have been taught this, that we are saved. We are being saved to be saved. So, we are saved in the past from the penalty of sin. We are being saved in the presence from the power of sin, we are going to be saved in the future from the presence of sin. So we are justified, we are being sanctified to be glorified. Now, each of these phases depends on the first. Sanctification is consequent, flows out of your justification. Salvation, we've said it already, you must be born again. And then you continue in sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit and obedience to the word of God. And then when he returns, we are glorified. So when we talk about this crown of glory, this, this expression speaks to ultimate salvation. Now the question is, what is ultimate salvation? I know you know, but let me try and put it this way. From all the studies we've made and all the things we've read, all the things we've heard, let me put it like this. Ultimate salvation is when the believer in his resurrected body possessing eternal righteousness stands in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in his everlasting kingdom. Did you get that? Let me go over it again. Ultimate salvation speaks to when the believer in his resurrected body possessing eternal righteousness stands in the physical, literal presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in his kingdom. Let me unpack that for you so you know what I'm talking about. There are four things in that. Number one, resurrected body. 
a glorified body. You know, this body is dying. What we call growth is dying actually. But so ultimate salvation speaks to a resurrected body. The believer in his resurrected body. Like the body of the Lord Jesus when he, raised, he was raised from the dead. But not only that, will we have the resurrected body, we will now possess eternal righteousness. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm only trying to say, talk about moral perfection. Sinless perfection. A time is coming when David, this guy, will be incapable, completely incapable of sin. Completely. Completely incapable. I will not be able to even think it or feel it or it will not even come. Just imagine how our God is right now. The Bible says in him there is no darkness. That's where we're going to arrive. Moral righteousness. Sinless perfection. Eternal righteousness. I will not need to have to struggle to bring my flesh under anymore. But not only will I Will you have a glorified body? Not only will you possess eternal righteousness, you will be standing in the physical, literal presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that song? I can only imagine what that day will be like. What I will do when I stand before him. You remember that song? Yeah, we're going to literally stand before him and see God. You see, the hope, the hunger, the desire of creation is to see God. To see God, to see him. And so we will see him. Now I'm describing the details of eternal, ultimate salvation. Not only we will have the resurrected body, eternal perfect uh, righteousness. Not only will we be standing in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, literally, physically. We will be in his kingdom. In his everlasting kingdom. The Bible says a day is coming when there will be only one Lord in all the earth. And his name will be Jesus Christ. Only one king. The Bible says the mountain of the Lord will fill every way in the world. Every nook and cranny will be the kingdom of our God and his Christ. There will be no more presidents or prime ministers or Obas or Olus. There will be only one king. And that kingdom will be forever and ever. In Hebrews he calls it the unshakable kingdom. That kingdom will never pass away. With eternal foundations, the home of righteousness, the dwelling of God for all eternity. That's what we're talking about. And that is the kingdom is promising us. The Bible says actually in somewhere in Luke 12, 32 if I'm not mistaken, it says fear not little flock, it is the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Resurrected body, eternal righteousness, Standing in the presence, the literal physical presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Now, all of this is ultimate salvation. You see, all of this now, we have not, we have actually not obtained any of this. This is still in the future. Yes, we are in the kingdom of God spiritually. But we're talking about the physical dimension of his kingdom. That is still in front of us. Now it is all of these things that I just tried to describe to you that we mean by reward. It is all of this that we're saying that the crown of glory speaks to. Okay now. I want you to keep this in your mind. And let's go to Philippians. Chapter 1. Are you still here? Philippians 1. Now, I asked for four people to come volunteer for this illustration. Are they ready? If you were told to come out, please just run up here so I can meet up with my time. Where are the other? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just please line up here and face the brethren. Come close. Just come close. Maybe like a foot between all of you. So we're going to read Philippians 1 again, verse 9 to 10. It says, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, 
that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. First of all, let me draw your attention to that four-letter word, that. Notice the word that keeps occurring. That, that, that. That your love may abound. That you may approve the things that are excellent. That you may be sincere. That, that. Now, the insertion of the word that makes what follows dependent on what was before. So, let's say this represents love. This represents things that are excellent. This represents sincere and without offense. This represents the day of Christ. Are you seeing it in the text? Can we have the text up? So we'll go over that again. He says, I pray that your love may abound in all knowledge and judgment. That you may approve the things that are excellent. That you may be without, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So you have the illustration now. In other words, this has to happen, love, so that this has to happen. That's why you have the word that. Are you with me? Love should abound so that you will be able to approve things that are excellent. Now, if you go to the Good News Translation, the phrase things that are excellent simply means to choose what is best. So I can caption that as right choices. In other words, to be able to make right choices, choices that please the Lord, what do you need? Love. You can't do this without this. And you see, once you begin to do this, what happens to you? You're what? Sincere? Without offense. And then he says, till the day of Christ. So let me ask you a question. Of all these four things, which is the most important? I knew you would say love. But that's not the answer I was looking for. The most important is the day of Christ. Oh, this is the most important day of your life. Not your anniversary, wedding anniversary, not your birthday. Not even the day you die, but the day of Christ. This is the hope of all creation. That the Lord, when he comes. Now, the Bible tells us, let me give you that text quickly. In Revelation chapter In Revelation, he says um, 22 verse 12. Let's read it. He says, And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me. So, we were talking about the reward earlier. What do we talk about the reward? The crown. Ultimate salvation. Resurrected body. Eternal perf- righteousness. Standing in the presence of the Lord Jesus. The king, all of that is the reward. It says when he comes, that is when he, he will bring it. Is that not so? Are you seeing how significant this day is? So, Paul, being a good pastor, wants to prepare his people for that day. When he will bring, when he will return and bring the reward. And he begins to think, what do they need? He says, what they need is that they must be without offense. They must be sincere, genuine. They must be in this state. For them to be in this state, they must make the right choices. Choose what's best. For them, for this to happen, what do you need? You need love. So Paul begins to bend his knees to pray, Father, let this happen. Because if this does not happen, this cannot happen. And if this does not happen, right choices are proven was excellent, this cannot happen. And if this does not happen, he says, you're going to miss the reward. And so he's praying and laboring and begging the Lord that your love may abound. Now what am I doing today? I'm simply just emphasizing what pastor taught us. The way, the path to receiving the crown, the reward is what? Where does it start with? Love. He said, don't deceive yourself. If you are not walking practically, pastor said it already. If you are not walking practically in love, 
this is what you're going to miss. Are you with me? This is what you're going to miss. You know, as pastor was speaking today, my heart was in every direction. My, I was, and then suddenly, and in fact, he mentioned it, Matthew 25. And he was talking about, if you remember, he was talking about, he says, he's going to say to some, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. You remember that? And then it dawned on me, Considering the response of the people, when did we see you hungry and we gave you food? When did we see you naked and we clothed you? What was the Lord's response? He says this is how he will respond. As long as you did it to one of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. Brethren, this is what that means. The way you treat your brother is exactly the way you are treating Jesus right now. Did you hear that? The way you are treating your brother in Christ. The way you are treating your sister. You see, some of you, your brother in Christ is your husband. Because he's a believer. For some of you, your sister in Christ is your wife. The way you are treating your husband is exactly the way you are treating the Lord. Forget about the lifting of hands, buying of knees and jumping and shouting and paying of tithes. That's not how you're treating the Lord. That's not what he uses to measure. He just looks at, what are you doing to one of these, my brethren? The way you're treating a fellow believer is exactly the way you're treating the Lord. I know somebody's going to say, so, listen, this is the most important message we have received today, love. Are you listening to me? That's why I'm here. Just to highlight what we have been told. That you see, the crime we're talking about is coming at this point. And that's what you need to prepare for it. That's what you need. That's what you need. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, it is at this point, everybody needs to examine himself. You need to think. You need to look at your own life. Start from your closest relationship. Because the Lord judges how you are treating him by the way you're treating him. Or her. You know what I mean by that? Your brethren. Thank you. Here we go sit. Please clap for them for me. So let me close with one other text of scripture Pastor quoted. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. You see, when you leave this conference, there should be only one prayer on your lips. Father, may my love abound. That should be the only prayer you should pray. Philippians 1, 9 should be, the, your Bible should be permanently open to that page. And if you're going to move to any other page, move to 1 Corinthians 13. And say, Lord, I must become this kind of disciple. Look at what it says in 1 Peter 1.22. It says, since you have purified, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Now, by the way, let me pause. Peter is really not saying that you did the purification. No, that's not what he's saying. He's just saying that, look, the part you played is that you obeyed. And he did the purification because he tells us that in other verses that we are sanctified through the sanctification of the spirit. That's what he says. Okay. He says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren. Now pause. I'm coming here because I just don't want anybody to miss what pastor said earlier. 
when it says purification of your souls, that's another terminology for the new birth experience. That's what he's saying, new birth, born again experience. That the new birth is a purification. It's a cleansing. And it's what the Holy Spirit does. So he says, by the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does it when you act on the gospel, when you obey the truth. Now the goal of this is to produce in you the nature of love. Sincere love. So he puts in you, installs in you as it were, the nature that can love. So you, it's there. It's like he puts the engine inside of you. But don't you, aren't you surprised the way Peter is speaking here? After he says, through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren. He now goes on to say, love one another. Is Peter repeating himself? No, no, no. This is what he's saying. You see, the phrase that follows, love one another, is a command. He's saying, now that you have the engine, the capacity, the nature to love, then love. Did anybody get that? In other words, this love is a command. And he's putting a command on you because he has already put what you need, what is required for you to do, obey. It's there. I mean, let me see if this will help you get my point. You see, when an unbeliever sins, you know what God feels? The emotions? Pity. Because the guy has got the disease like we all had got the disease. But when a Christian sins, you know what God feels? Shock. Ha. Huh. Adam. Ha. Huh. Why will he be shocked? Because he has fixed the same problem already in you. Is that not so? So he's surprised, but I've already done the work. So why? So why are you? So you see, the power to love, the nature to love, the capacity to love is inside all of us. The Bible says it is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It's there. But you see, it's inside. It's latent. The nature, the power is there. And now says, now that you have the power, then put it to action. Why is that important? I just showed you from Philippians. Re-echoing what pastor already said this morning is because of the day of Christ. The day he is coming with his reward. And I've just told you, given you an idea of what that reward is. The believer in his resurrected body, possessing eternal righteousness, standing in the physical, literal presence of the Lord Jesus in his everlasting kingdom. That's it. That's where we are running to. That's what we are racing for. That's what we are in the race to win. I've come to see that many of us are not in the race to win the prize. Paul says no, but he says run to win. That's what you should be doing. Run to win. Strive to win the crown. Strive to win the crown. And what do I need? The track, the way to go, the path is love. Let me close with this thought. I read 1 Corinthians uh, 1 9 talking about a race so I asked myself the question when I read it the athletes the Olympic athletes and Paul was actually drawing from what we call the Isthmian games that used to happen every two years in Corinth in his time when they run they run in the stadium the artistic forms of the competition take, take place in the theaters. Some of you who run, if you're going to run, you go to the track in Ogbe Stadium. Is that not so? But when the Christian is going to run, where is the track? Where is the field? Do you know the field? Now, some of you have treadmills in your homes. So when you want to run in your bedroom, you climb on that treadmill. And you begin to run. Where, on what does the believer run? What's the field? 
Now, I want you to imagine that we're going to remove the treadmill. We're going to put something else. We're going to put everyday life. That's where you're running on. Everyday life is the field on which Christians are running. You know what that means? It means that your relationship with your spouse is the field you're running on. Your attitude in the office, your work is the field. So there's never a time you're not running. You're always running. The question is, are you running well? Are you running to win a prize? The measure of how to know whether you're running well is the love. Do you have the love walk? Do you have the love walk? Peter says, love one another. And he used the word agape. Unconditional love. This is not the love that is giving because the other person deserves it. I've always told you the story of the couple who came to me. The mother-in-law was complaining about the husband. And this had gone on for years. And I was just tired of it. So I told myself I was not going to say a word if the Lord didn't give me a word. So I invited him and the wife to the office. I invited him, he brought his wife. And I made up my mind, if the Lord does not say anything to me, I won't tell him, I won't, I would just reschedule the meeting. So he told me his own side of the story. Just when he was going to round up and I was praying to say, okay, I've heard you. I've heard you, yeah? you know what? Let's see again. Just when I was preparing to say that and he was round winding down, I heard in my spirit tell him, your good behavior to your mother-in-law should not be because she deserves it, but because your Lord demands it. And then I just said it verbatim. Your good behavior to your mother-in-law should not be because she deserves it, but because your Lord demands it. And he said, ha, ah, pastor. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, honey, let's go. He ended the meeting himself and left. Two weeks later, I got a recharge card from his mother-in-law. Now you can see what happened. His attitude changed. What am I saying? You see, this love walk, it's not because people deserve it, but because our Lord demands it. Let us pray.